Yeah, hello. Um, a woman to our last session conference, New World uh, Werklights Festival. Be happy to our first. Uh, um, before I do that, uh, I'm then. My name is my colleague Sandra Naumann. I curated the conference and um, we'll just uh, quickly uh, introduce our guests now and then hand over the microphone um, to introduce you now uh, we have our uh, keynote speaker guest Benjamin Breton and I'm really happy that he can be here with us uh, not in person but at least online and um, yeah, people, and you will probably already know him as a, um, yeah, the sociologist, architectural and design theorist, uh, known for his uh, philosophical and aesthetic research, various publications on the, on the cultural implications uh, of computing and globalization. He's also a professor of visual arts and the director of the Center for Design and Geopolitics at the University of California in San Diego and also program director of the new normal program at Strelka Institute of Media Architecture and Design in Moscow. And his keynote uh, talk today has the title, The Re Revenge of the Real Politics for a Post-Pandemic World and is based on <coughs> his new book uh, with the same title, which will be uh, published in only a couple of days. And um, in his talk, he will be addressing the multiple interconnected dilemmas that we are facing now, such as climate change, pandemics, the tension between the individual and society. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the talk. And um, our second guest is Rahel Süß. She's a political theorist researching digital te technologies and the future of democracy at the Humboldt University in Berlin. She is the founder of the journal Engagé and the founding director of da the Data Politics Lab. And I'm really happy to have both of you here. Um, and uh, I will hand over the uh, word to Rahel. Just a last uh, reminder to our audience. We have on the website, we have the chat. And um, you're welcome to send us questions, comments, etc. cetera. And um, yeah really take part in, uh, in the later discussion and conversation with Rahel also. And um, the final reminder, we also have again, um, our uh, simultaneous in, uh, interpreters who will translate everything into German. So at this point and after a long day of uh, many talks, a big thank you also to the team, the Comunicada team around uh, Lilian Astrid Gese for that. But now, without further ado, I hand over to Rahel and um, yeah, looking much forward. Thank you, Daniela, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. While people are still joining, I believe, I would like to just say a few things about the topic, introducing a bit today's keynote, giving you a few ideas of what you also can expect in the next uh, 90 minutes. So in today's keynote, Benjamin Breton will talk about the revenge of the real politics for a post-pandemic world. And Daniela already said that this is also the title of his forthcoming book, which will be out with Verso by the end of this month. And you probably have noticed that there is a lot of writing and publishing going on, like on the topic of the pandemic. And I think we can say that like a shared assumption often is that the pandemic actually has reinforced and stabilized already existing social illnesses. But I think it's fair to say that not only scholars try to make sense of what's actually happening, also social movements and governments. And last week, the G7 actually draw the lessons from the pandemic. So some of you have probably read about this. So there was a lot of talk about the so-called Cornwall consensus and its slogan to build forward better from the pandemic. And at the center of their agenda is to tackle social challenges such as global health, public health, climate change, but also digital 
related challenges. And these are also all concerns of the revenge of the real. So I had the chance to actually read the book already. And I can tell you there are many hot takes in it. And I would say counterintuitive arguments. And I really look forward to discuss some of them at the end of this, um, at, a, at the end of your talk, Benjamin. So, but for now, I just want to give you like a brief idea of what you can expect in, in, in the next 90 minutes, as I said before. So in line with the theme of this year festival, Benjamin will talk more about what is actually in disorder and what lessons can be drawn from the pandemic. And finally, how can we imagine a new world and a post-pandemic politics? And I think there are at least three questions quite relevant here. So one is, why is the pandemic a revenge of the real? And how could and should planetary governments look like in a post-pandemic world? And finally, Benjamin is suggesting um, a notion of a positive biopolitics. And we want to know, of course, what does all of this has to do with this positive uh, biopolitics? So, I actually also thought introducing Benjamin, but just I noticed that Daniela actually has done it already. So I skipped this part and I just give you an idea of uh, what's happening next. So Benjamin will talk about, uh, yeah, about 45 minutes. And then we have a discussion of, I would say like about 30 minutes probably. And we invite everyone to engage in the conversation. So you can ask your question by posting your question in the chat. And we would like to ask you that you start your question with question, like in capital letters. So for us, it's easier to actually spot them in the chat. We also recommend keeping an eye on the chat uh, throughout the, the talk because we might actually share, share some um, additional um, yeah, resources on the topic and also our speaker. So, I think with this, because much has been said already about Benjamin Breton, who is an interdisciplinary academic and is doing research, is doing research on how technology is actually changing our society. But I stop here and I just say, Benjamin, thanks again for being with us tonight. And once again, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation to, to join you today. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can show you some of the slides with it today. Okay, so thanks again. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today and to share a little bit of what's, um, what, I've been, what I've been thinking about over the, 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 over the course of the pandemic. Um, we've all sort of obviously experienced this extremely strange year, um, extremely strange year different, differently. The, um, what, the way in which I, the um, way in which I, Sort of try to work work through it was really was to way to kind of put some of my thoughts down on on paper uh, and to try to make sense really of what was going on, um, what it meant, what its implications were, and and, and what what should come next. Um, and to greater or lesser degree, kind of based on a, a notion that this really didn't have to happen the way that it did. Um, that the the way in which particularly Western um, Western political cultures responded to the to the to the challenge of the pandemic um, was one that, in many respects, demonstrated um, a number of a rather fundamental um, fundamental crises, uh, uh, weaknesses, and incapacities within within those cultures. And so, while that might be you know, disturbing and distressing to a certain sort of degree that the even greater mistake would be to not try to really seriously and soberly and directly try to learn the lessons of, of, of this. And so to a certain extent, um, the way in which you might read this book um, is, is again, I, I mean, I don't, I with set it up as a sort of like, there's a number of sort of takes on what the pandemic meant. I, I, I think it, what you'll find is, is, is a sense that the way in which we have are, are already arriving at a kind of common sense about what happened and and what it all means uh, is it, not necessarily the one that is going to be most uh, that would be most fruitful that would be most important for us to say. And so, I appreciate your the the chance to share with you some of my thoughts on 
on, on all of this. So let me begin. Um, so first with, um, you know, what happened? Uh, we have a, we've, we've all lived through this and really kind of some strange year. And I, I think in the next few weeks, next few months are going to be, we'll also be living through a number of sort of takes, uh, uh, takes around this. Let me, let me give you my take. First, I would say that as mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic was among other things, a crisis um, of the West's ability to govern. And a lot of my remarks will be focusing on, on, on Western countries, uh, on, on Western countries in, 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 in particular. Um, uh, the, the ways in which um, we tried in, in that, instead of seeing the, the pandemic as what we might think of as a kind of state of exception, as a kind of extraordinary moment in which the rules were suspended and that this has um, sort of nothing to do with, with the way the, the normal course of things, it would be better to see it as has already been suggested as the kind of revealing of a number of pre-existing conditions um, that the effects of the last 10 years of, or 40 years, depending on how you want to sort of look at it, the last 10 years of the rise of populist politics, 40 years of the rise of the dismantling of forms of state governance in, in, in the West, put us in a, put Western countries and political cultures in a position by which they were so, um, so unable to respond to, to respond to this crisis. Um, Pandemic politics, as suggested by the title of what we would want to think of it, and, or the pandemic itself really understood as a kind of revenge of the real. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. It, it, it addresses the sort of non-negotiable realities um, in, in, in ways in which of, of a virus, of epidemiology, of, of our own immune systems, of contagion vectors and so forth, in ways that upend or disqualify in a certain sense the kinds of comfortable illusions um, and cultural na and narratives that that uh, may wish to subordinate that reality and does so no matter how hard um, some may try to push back against that reality with their their own chosen form of, of magic so the most difficult lessons to be learned uh, from the pandemic are those that come when reality in the form of a virus, um, it, of our vulnerability to it, of our inadequate governing responses to it, um, crashes through these comforting illusions and ideologies. Uh, and to a greater or lesser degree, I think that is what we just lived through. That is what just happened. So to the question of a post-pandemic politics, um, as, as I'll try to take some pains to, to, to introduce some nuance on this, when I'm talking about when the question of politics or the question of governance, this is not necessarily the same thing as governments. Uh, it, it may include governments, but there's a, there's a more fundamental question of governance, of how it is that a society comes to be able to compose itself, uh, author itself, uh, enforce its decisions in such a way that it is a more fundamental notion of governance. And of course, governments uh, have a lot, have a big role to play in. But just to be clear that in, in, in my remarks, in, in, there will be many ways talking about the ways in which we will uh, wish to rethink the role of, of how states interact with societies. Um, but also, and I think maybe more importantly, how uh, society, and particularly a planetary society, would come to know itself uh, and care for itself and to be able to compose itself. And when I say planetary, what I'm referring to is that quite clearly, this pandemic is one that, uh, that it operated and continues to operate um, at the scale of that, of the scale of that planetarity. And so in many respects, maybe one of the things that it has revealed as it has mapped us, like we map the virus while well, the virus has also mapped us. It has mapped our own planetarity in a way that has made explicit, in a way that has made clear the inadequacies of, our, of the techniques of governance and composition 
that we may wish to place at our disposal to respond, respond to it. So what were those responses? Well, first, the, we should, I, I, we will probably look back upon this pandemic uh, the, the, in its, the most sort of fundamental sociological fact of the pandemic uh, was that this filtering uh, of an otherwise mobile and migratory planetary population sorted back into their respective countries of passport. Americans back to America, Portuguese back to Portugal, Brazilians back to Brazil and so forth. As if the Westphalian state were the only and, and logical uh, uh, condition by which uh, any a kind of uh, a kind of public health and other kinds of uh, health health services could be provided to people. But maybe even bigger than that, um, we may look back upon the the pandemic as uh, where the global population participated uh, in what a future political science might look back upon as the largest control experiment in comparative governance in history um, with the virus as the control variable and hundreds of different states and political cultures as the experimental variables. Um, and the results I think are plain to see. Um, some countries and some states and some political cultures did well, some did very poorly, and there are clear patterns in, in, in why, that, why that might be. And it doesn't have to do entirely with, it has a lot to do with, with, with wealth, but it doesn't have entirely to do. In many cases, many of the world's richest countries were unable to perform even the most basic feats of self-administration, like uh, inclusive testing and, and vaccine distribution. And as said, some of this does have to do with the regimes that were in power at that moment, particularly the populist regimes um, that, that, that performed the worst, but it also has to do with the political cultures um, of those places and, and the logic of governance and the logic of self-governance that may exist there. And, with, and at a cultural level, this may have been to some extent more determined. That is the reason one country succeeded uh, where another one failed is not only because of different policies, it is also because of the different cultures that might accept or reject those policies in the first place. Uh, what worked in Taiwan may be culturally unacceptable in Italy or Texas. And so when we look at the body count of some of these areas, we can point to the governments, we can point to the policies, but we also need to be willing to point to ourselves. More generally, and I, 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 it is my hope that for a post-pandemic politics, uh, that this revenge of the real should be a, a death blow to the reactionary forms of political populism of recent years. And by these, I define, you know, not the cultural or political project of the working class, but rather the kind of uh, the forms of political populism that are built on simple, cathartic stories of resentments and recrimination uh, that, that a, preferred, uh, a preferred simple narrative of how the world works can actually effectively subordinate the real to its purposes. This is what I mean. Um, this populism, as I'll talk a little bit about later, uh, is, is, is both a cause, but it is also an effect. It is the effect of a generational, generation long dismantling of public systems uh, of, of governance and forms of international cooperation that have in turn dismantled the very premise of, of uh, governmental competence. Now, how did we get there? What was this dismantling? Well, at least since the beginning of the neoliberal era, in the names of 
markets or in the name of bottom-up cooperation, in the name of a programmatic, uh, uh, an idealization of, of horizontalism. Societies have been left with little but um, increasingly pathological forms of emergence. And so as the, as the spine continues to break, um, the principles of, of, a, of a politics that is able to author a, a compose a society, the general response is to further attack the very idea of governance itself on behalf of yet more uh, empathic spontaneity, yet more uh, doubling down, tripling down on the principles of uh, that, that it is possible for a society to organize itself without authority. This is not politics. This is, that is the definition to me of post-politics and of the post-political. So populism thrives, let's say, because of a sense that the system is broken. Uh, and to be sure, um, in many ways, it is. But it is, it is not broken in the ways that populists believe that it is and not in the ways that demagogues would preach it. And so the underlying reality that may have a, a biological reality, a chemical reality, a biochemical reality, such as at, you know the issue of, 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 that are brought by uh, governing issues such as climate change, um, are, are deeply and fundamentally indifferent to this kind of culturalist determinism, this kind of, 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 of intensive narrativization of, of the world and the notion that politics can be reduced to aesthetic acts uh, or, perf or, preferred, or preferred narratives. One of the things that we all experience to a greater or lesser degree um, and I actually think is, is probably a very important lesson, a positive lesson to bring forward from the pandemic into the post-pandemic is what we might call an epidemiological view of society. So what do I mean by that? Well, the epidemiological view of society doesn't just have to do with contagion. It has to do with the, the relationship between the individual and the collective between a, a person and the group and a subjectivity and objectivity and how one sees oneself in relationship to the, the larger uh, undulation of contexts and networks in which one is situated and which make one's own, uh, one's, one's own person and subject possible. So the epidemiological view should sift, shift our sense of subjectivity, I think, away from a prioritization of private individuation and towards uh, a deeper and more nuanced vocabulary of public transmissibility. The, the emphasis shifts from a prioritization of personal experience and toward responsibilities that are couched in the underlying biological and chemical realities that always have uh, bound us together. They always have been there, always have provided for the possibility of those conditions, uh, and now should draw uh, should be the, our, our primary uh, draw our primary attention. And so, for social theory more broadly, I think the this this trend this a rotation towards the a, 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 a different kind of appreciation for the underlying biochemical reality of the that preconditions the possibility of society would shift and 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 reframe many of the kinds of the conventional discussions that we are all familiar with between the relative uh, relative relations of individual uh, and individual and society how so well it would, it would see the subject object uh, dynamic of which each of us is, is, is part of um, it through the, the lens of, of an organism that is a transmission medium for information. 
from, from ideas to viruses. Um, uh, one who, who is, all, each and every one of us, defined by who and what each of us is connected to and disconnected from. And so the political premise, the biopolitical premise, premise of, 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 quote, immunization, that is to make oneself immune uh, by excluding someone or excluding someone else, would, would need to be couched then in the in conceptual and technical models of the social that are as inclusive and as agnostic as the epidemiological models which have carried the same weight and responsibility. But by that I mean an epidemiological model of a contagion vector of within a society is and its representation of the collective risk only works as a model if it is inclusive if it is an inclusive across across the boundaries of so, of socially constructed divisions of race or class or, or gender the the contagion vectors are deeply indifferent to those kinds of divisions that the con, that the connectivity that the material reality of our of the of exactly how collective our our own biological risk actually is demands a, um, a conceptualization, a modeling of the social that is equally inclusive and agnostic as an epidemiological model. This is why I think it constitutes not just a, a medical technique, but the basis of, a, of a, 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 a mode of social theory. Um, I, I think then in that shift, in that deprioritization of the let's say the kind of cultural and anthropological divisions of a society on behalf of the, the physical material one also represents a shift in the priority of self-identification and symbolic interaction. And so in many ways, I think the epidemiological model of society is, is then foundational for what a, a viable post-pandemic politics may look like. It is the basis for our rethinking our, each of our roles and positions within society and ultimately even what a society is. Um, here, subjectivity is not conceived in the common sense notion of a self-sovereign individual that would then subsequently enter into social and economic relationships, um, nor is it as part of a collective that is given shape by its allegiance to a set of symbolic obligations of such as citizenship. Both of these act would then give way instead to an understanding and appreciation of the social as such, that is, as I say, more biological, even biochemical. This is importantly how for this to be properly epidemiological in the sense because epidemiology is not only describing a situation, it is also the science for understanding that situation. By this, I don't simply mean a kind of simple biological reductionism. I also mean the way in which um, we are able to sense, make sense, abstract, model, simulate, to understand that condition, to construct abstractions, both qualitative and quantitative, of that epidemiological condition, of that conceptualization of society that would form the basis by which that society is able to equitably and rationally compose itself. This is the, this is the, the, the ultimate purpose of the, this epidemiological shift for post-pandemic politics. Now, let me talk then a bit about this shift in the relationship between one sense of, sense of self as a subject versus one sense of self as an object, and where the question of an ethical obligations uh, and conditions for participation within that epidemiology may sit. And the example that I, I'll, I'll try to draw from for this is from the what we call here in the United States, the mask wars. That is the way in which the very act of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask became a flashpoint in an ongoing cultural civil war uh, and, and a civil war that increasingly became, at least with the pandemic, 
between those whose allegiance was primarily to what Foucault might call a kind of sovereign power versus those whose interest was in what he might call a form of biopower. The mask wars revealed among many, many other things, the destructive and indeed self-destructive nature of libertarian individualism, unable as it was to articulate a coherent ethics of an immunological commons beyond, um, beyond a number of, of fragile slogans. But let me ask then that about why we wore the masks uh, and what, what we were, why we, what those who chose to do so, what might have been the basis of this choice in terms of the, the, re, the shifting of a sense of subject and object that was part of this, um, this, the, this action and gesture toward, the, um, toward one another. And what do so, we may ask the question of when we pass a stranger in the street, how is it that the, the, the ethics of that encounter shift from subjective intention, one that's about the subjective intention of harm or goodwill or endearment towards the biological objective circumstance of contagion itself, the, the, what I call the ethics of being an object. And what do I, let me unpack that. What I mean is when I put on the mask, and I come in contact with a stranger. I, I, I may have, I may like this person or dislike this person. I may have love or hatred towards them, but my the likelihood that I will cause them harm and injury by infecting them has nothing to do with this, my subjective internal disposition towards them, my internal mental state and my affective, uh, my affective um, sense of, 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 of uh, animosity or love for them is irrelevant to whether or not I would harm them. I would harm them not as a subject, in other words, but as an, but as an, but as an object. And this, I think, represents also not only a, 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 a shift or an additional transformation in what, how we might think about the, the basis by which social ethics emerges, but also certainly a point of confusion because of that. Um, it, it represents a shift in ethics from a position that calibrates subjective moral will uh, to one that, that the more, if I can calibrate my internal moral state, that, that this will be externally expressed in um, a better community toward one that recognizes oneself and body as an object in a cause and effect relationship with, with the world. Why does this may be confusing? Well, because self-evidently it is often presumed that agency and subjectivity, and if not also identity, are in essence interchangeable. But but instead, what the, the consequentialist ethics of being and object, less less a subject, works differently than that. Outcomes are not a mirror of an internal mental state. The calibrations of one's subjectivity does not constitute the basis of that of, of, of one's ethical responsibility. Rather, the calibrations of one's objectivity constitutes this. This and and so that calibration is is based again on this the disclosure or revelation of an underlying bio socio biochemical reality. It is not directly dependent upon public demonstration. Uh, symbolic performance uh, or ritual in order to affect physical change uh, or the calibration of or the calibration of, of harm. And so, to be sure, um, this is this is I, I think a fundamental lesson for post-pandemic politics, but it is one that is 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 sure to be confusing in some regards because it complicates. Um, the depth and tenacity of, of, of particularly in rich Western countries, of the cultures of individualism, subjectivism, experientialism, that one's own experience of the world constitutes a, a, a deep good in and of its own sake, which, uh, you know, an, an ethos that keeps the art world afloat. 
uh, now uh, it, it needs, that, that these constitute the center of a conception of the common, the common good. I, a couple of days ago, I was on a podcast where I was making this point, and it, it, I was really surprised how difficult it was to to simply to, to sort of to get across the simple idea that the, a presumption that the expressions of one's subjectivity, that, that the idea that the expression of one's subjectivity constitutes the basis of ethical action, whereas the constitutions of one one's objectivity only constitutes the basis of some kind of instrumental oppression, may not actually work. That this that that, that, that there are ways in which one's objectivity may constitute the basis of one's um, of, of one's uh, social ethical obligations was an extraordinary difficult um, pill to swallow. I was surprised, but maybe I shouldn't have been. These, these habits and impulses um, uh, of, of the relationship between the subjective and the objective are deep within the core of Western social, Western social thought, particularly since the mid 20th century. And so their tenacity their, their, their tenacity would, should be anything, would obviously be rather stubborn. Let me then, um, to try to prove my point on that a little bit further, um, let me offer uh, an example that is on the one hand um, more uh, general and specific, um, uh, general and specific uh, from this. Uh, philosophy in many ways in humanities failed the pandemic uh, failed to give us um, the, the, the models that we needed, perhaps precisely because they had locked themselves into an untenable set of axioms that were unable to account for the epidemiological reality of mutual contagion. That is, despite the pandemic, this, during the pandemic, when society needed to grasp the big picture and to make sense of the confusion on the planetary scale, philosophy, obviously, spelled spelled uh, innovatively here, failed the moment. Sometimes with ignorance, sometimes with incoherence, sometimes with outright intellectual fraud. The lesson, um, which again, I think is both sort of extreme, in some ways, this sort of extreme example, in some ways actually extraordinarily typical um, of, of the Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben and his responses to the pandemic in part may tell us why. Um, Agamben, for those who are less familiar with his work, um, is an Italian philosopher and theologian famous for his critiques of biopolitics, uh, construed in a almost exclusively negative connotation that have broadly influenced uh, the humanities uh, perspectives on biology, society, science, uh, and politics, and wield a considerable, uh, and, and, and particularly since um, over the last 20 years or so. Um, Agamben, however, spent the pandemic in, in, in a number of sort of requests for commentary on this, this extraordinary biopolitical phenomenon to which philosophy may have given some wisdom. Instead, he spent the pandemic publishing at least a dozen or two editorials, essentially denouncing all attempts to manage the situation in ways that not only closely parallel right-wing and left-wing conspiracy theories, uh, but in many respects are, are indistinguishable from them. Why so? Why so? Well, over, as I said, over the past two decades, the influence of Agamben's work has, been, has, has cemented um, a perhaps somewhat stale academic orthodoxy that is suspicious of it within humanities and arts, more generally social sciences to a certain degree, suspicious of any governing intervention in the biological condition of human society as implicitly, or in some cases explicitly totalitarian that biopolitics is totalitarian and the totalitarianism is biopolitical. And the essentially a kind of, of deep, uh, deep conflation of these constitutes the Agambenian theory of history. It sees any contemporary biotechnology, 
as a coercive manipulation of bodily sovereignty, as a lived experience, as a cultural vessel, uh, as a traditional experience of being human. And it does so in such, but it essentially it, it has become in a way, some of the Agambenian impulses have become so axiomatic uh, within the humanities that to suggest something that with biotechnologies, something more productive and fundamental and profound is possibly at work, uh, in the composition of life uh, is to sometimes invite scorn. So what did he do? What did he say? Well, beginning in February, 2020 with an article called uh, The Invention of the Epidemic, The Invention of the Epidemic, Agamemnon straight up called the virus a hoax um, that, and the belated lockdowns in Italy, he called a techno-medical despotism uh, this was followed up by a number of, of essays uh, sort of doubling and tripling down uh, on, this, on, on this point. Later on, uh, as, as planetary society came to accommodate um, the, the, the fallout of a number of policy failures we were left to work with and began, for example, teaching classes online, this itself was met with uh, rather extreme scorn in an essay called Requiem for the Students. He denounced directly the Zoom seminars um, that were keeping education going, uh, not only as an acqui acquiescence to, quote, Silicon Valley concentration camps, his words, but directly linked the professors, such as perhaps you and I, who continue to teach our students remotely comparing us to, to the professors who continue to teach in Germany under national socialism and the acquiescence to an illegitimate form of totalitarianism. I don't mean to suggest this, he implied this in some way that might invite other readings. This was directly his point. Later on, um, essay called The Face and Death, he derided the use of masks more generally uh, as sacrificing the ritual humanity of the naked face. Now, I should say that um, I, I'm certainly not the only one who found Agamemnon's remarks uh, uh, bizarre, uh, unhelpful, and perhaps uh, disingenuous, perhaps dangerous. Not the only one who was saw the links between his rather extreme commentary and the general uh, the general tone of, bio, of, of the last 20 years of, of biopolitical critique, and certainly not the only one who was, it was even his friends, I should say, in a short essay written right after, really early on in the pandemic, um, after even each essay becoming more absurd and strident than the last, but early on, his friend, the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, wrote a piece that warned us that he that about an episode that we should in essence not listen to Agamemnon. that he talked about a lesson in which he earlier on was contemplating getting a heart transplant obviously a rather complicated medical uh, uh, procedure and Agamemnon had told him not to not to acquiesce to this abomination and Agamemnon said I thankfully I ignored him otherwise I would be dead so again, in, in all of the essays, all of which are freely available online, he explicitly rejects all pandemic mitigation measures on, on behalf of a kind of embrace tradition, refuse modernity uh, uh, attitude that, uh, that refuses to acknowledge that biological reality is in fact real. Um, and so again, it is not surprising then perhaps that Agamben, um well respected on, on the left in many regards, earned the thanks of the Liga Nord uh, and the global anti-masker and vaccine movements uh, vindicated and validated as they were by the eminent philosophers learning words. His conclusions, more explicitly his references to tradi uh, traditional communitarianism, the, the importance of the role of, 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 of the Catholic Church in as a proper biopolitical, biopolitical authority um, are, 
really quite similar to the conclusions of, for example, um, the Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro. That is, they both came to the conclusion uh, rather adamantly that the virus is an overblown plot by the technomedical globalists to undermine traditional authority and natural bodily and communitarian coherency. Uh, the conclusion I draw is that uh, his contributions are an elaborate defense, like Bolsonaro's, of a pre-Darwinian concept of the human, but ultimately he is not defending life, he is refusing it. So now, while Agamben's own worldview is classically Europeanist, Europeanist, dripping with lurid Heideggerian theology, his influence on the humanities and the influence of the biopolitical critique that bears his name is much wider and deeper than that. His, his mode of biopolitical critique ventures that science and data and observation and modeling are simply really at the end of the day, forms of domination and games of power relations that, that there is no real to be disclosed that is not other than, other than through this. It is a disposition more in, in different ways and in different voices and different emphases that can be found in the work of Hannah Arendt, Michel Foucault, uh, especially um, Ivan Illich, the, the, the anarchist priest that Okruf Agamben was fond of, 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 fond of, quite fond of, who, Illich who died from a facial tumor that he refused to treat as doctors recommended. And I can say that even here at the University of California, San Diego, which is, which is a hub of interdisciplinary uh, biotechnology research, many of my own coll colleagues will continue to insist that, quote, the digitalization of nature is, quote, an impossible fantasy, even at the moment that they accept into their arm an mRNA vaccine that was based on a prototype uh, bioprinted from a computational model of that virus's genome uploaded from China before the actual virus even made it to North America. There is a fundamental disconnect between the world in which we live and the ways in which humanities and philosophies are able to provide us models for it. All right, let me extend this um, and uh, away from philosophy and towards something that we all may be experiencing a little bit, a little bit more on this and having to do with the question of, 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 not, of data and modeling, not just in the laboratory, but in our own lives. One of the other key lessons of the pandemic, I think for post-pandemic politics is that the term quote unquote surveillance cannot possibly describe all the ways that a society needs to be able to make sense of itself. It's not that I'm not arguing that now surveillance is good, but rather that the term surveillance is too simple, too blunt, and has become debilitating. We need more a more nuanced vocabulary to describe all the ways in which a society would wish to make sense of itself. And for that, I think the conversation on legitimate and, and illegitimate forms of data production uh, needs to be understood in relation to a more expanded notion of what we might call the sensing layer of society. <clears throat> a good definition of the sensing layer would refer to all of the ways in which society is able to sense what is going on at both granular and holistic levels so as to make a model that it may use to act back upon itself and therefore govern itself. And so that principle applies to obviously a lot more than just the pandemic. Climate science, for example, senses all manner of things, atmospheric CO2, the ice cores and so forth to produce models of the planet. Again, based on atmospheric sensors, surveillance level sensors, all matter of on-site thermometers and monitors and archives and so on and so on. Uh, each of which produces little bits of information and then ultimately contribute to models of climate, uh, models of change abstracted from the sum of individual moments of sensing. I don't think it would be appropriate to call climate science surveillance uh, and it be, though it, not because it's not sensing and modeling, but because the term surveillance doesn't really capture the, the, the qualities of, of, of what the social implications of this kind of 
sensing and modeling really are. And indeed, uh, when we're talking about these questions of planetary scale computation, it is important to remember that the very idea of climate change, not the physical fact, but the concept of climate change is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. Without this capacity to sense and model the world in this way, the, the, the models and the patterns of pl planetary transformation would not be comprehensible. And so in the context of the pandemic, um, the sensing layer would include access to all kinds of testing, to diagnosis. In other words, to being a body that counts, to be excluded from testing and, and being sensed is to not count. And during the pandemic, many societies sensing layer failed. Um, and, and they did so not only because the technology broke down, but because the social systems and the, and the institutional structures were, 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 were misstructured. Ultimately, testing and sensing are the same thing. There are high touch and high tech ways in which a society senses and makes sense of itself. It is not an argument for tech, it is an argument for sensing and making sense. To have a more widely available testing is to have more accurate sensing, which means better models, which means a better public health response. To have inadequate planning and provision for testing is to have inadequate modeling, which means inadequate governance. Cities that have passed this test were able to flatten the curve. Cities that failed this test turned sports arenas into makeshift morgues. And so whether we realize it or not, I think many of the critiques of surveillance, of which we're all overly familiar probably, have less to do really, I think, with the problems of quantitative modeling itself than rather with what we have asked it to do and why, such as advertising and political, uh, political manipulation. And this can and must change. Uh, but for that to happen, especially in the West, uh, there needs to be a shift in the cultural valence and sense of what we mean by sensing and ultimately what is called surveillance and the expansion of this to, to a much more uh, nuanced and useful vocabulary. However, that shift, that positive shift is prevented um, by the current uses of, of, of computation more, and sensing more generally. It is prevented by the structuring demands of a myopic capital drawing upon the political and interface cultures of hyper individuation. And this is the key point I want to draw on this, that, it, that the hyper individuation, the use of computation to individuate, to model and predict the interests and desires and affect of individuated human subjects is in essence the fundamental error that, can, that needs to be addressed. And it is one that is not addressed by the conventional critiques of surveillance and surveillance capitalism. Not only not addressed, it's in fact, I would argue, uh, reconcretized by these critiques in many ways that of hyper-individuation. What I describe as a kind of recipe of neoliberal social psychology. But it is also, as said, one of the ways that the quote surveillance capitalism is described by critics like Shoshana Zuboff here, quote, surveillance is presented as an illegitimate relationship between a private individual and a coercive collective corporation. What's left uncriticized is the much deeper issue of the organization of planetary comp scale computation around predicting and placating individual human desires in the first place. It is a logic that is largely reinforced and legitimized by Zuboff and others' defense of the abused autonomy of the self-sovereign individual subject. That there is a self-sovereign individual subject who is being abused by these platforms and that the counter-weaponization of their privacy and their self-privatization constitutes the basis of the remedy uh, rather than a dismantling of the use of planetary scale computation towards this hyper-individuation in the first place. <clears throat> 
I recall a, a conversation early, very early in the pandemic, a rather heated conversation, I should say, with, with, with a, a Germany-based critical theorist of AI who, who argued to me that pervasive testing in general should be avoided because in his words, it only encouraged big data biopolitics. And for him, that was the greater problem. And he went so far as to tell his own students to refuse testing. Uh, and this, this, this stuck with me for some time. And, and I, I mentioned it to some of my own students at UC San Diego, one of which we had a little discussion about it. One of which was a student who sort of defended this idea and saying that the, the, that the slippery slope into a kind of biopolitical totalitarianism and, and the perforation of one's sovereign capacity of self-construction was at stake. A number of the other students, particularly though in this case, particularly those who came from parts of San Diego County where there was no testing available, where access to access to 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 testing what was received, they argued that, that in this sense that it was the real problem was the construction of a biopolitical system by which they did not count, by which their bodies were not tested, not observed, not surveilled in this way, and that to be made into a body that count was the in fact the more prim, the, the more the important principle. But for those who have the privilege the privilege of being someone who can spend their life cultivating their own sense of subjectivity the premise that they one may the premise of one's objectivity may feel like an insult um but for those who have not uh this may be harder to harder to grasp so let me put it differently um if individual personal data privacy is held as the core essential path for liberation from tyrannical capture as well as the linchpin cause around which the bio, the political cr critique of computation is supposed to revolve. This will, if successful, only entrench the primary pathology, a grotesquely flattening social atomization. The problem is not that romantic, narcissistic, bourgeois, liberal individualism has been tainted and distorted by bad man with bad machine. The problem is romantic, narcissistic, bourgeois, liberal individualism itself. Much of today's tech flash criticism is a creepy love letter to it. Furthermore, we can't just, quote, take back our data from the bad actors, Facebook and so forth, and presume that we will then have the data as a society that is necessary, that we will need to, for the purposes of self-organization and, and self-governance that is necessary because it is the wrong data. Data about predicting individual habits and consumption of, of, of likes and memes is not useful for the positive biopolitics that we actually need. And for this reason, without a dismantling of the, of the logic of, of planetary scale computation around hyper-individuation, we will never get the data that we do need. So what are some alternative paradigms then of what data may look like? Well, there are several. Um, quickly, one is one sense it may look more like an archive, an archive, um, a promise to the future that, that the present will be accountable. Uh, it, it is, it, it, an archive is in that sense a faithful and inclusive representation of the deeper moments of the now sampled and prepared for future investigation. And second is the, the ultimate then social function of data uh, is in, in its representation is unknown now because it can't be known what will be asked in the future. It is a true abstraction that is only possible through the extension of focused secular technical reason beyond the horizon of one location or moment or lifetime. I think it's essential to the post pandemic politics we require. Or per Derrida, uh, the archive is a promise to the future that the present time will make itself accountable. Well, yes, it can also be a technology that, that will ensure that the future is even possible. Let me conclude then with a couple of then more specific remarks on what I mean by a positive biopolitics and in relationship to the theme of this conference of what we might mean by a quote new quote world quote order or where we make sense of that. And then we can get to the more 
uh, fun part of the more interesting part of this, which will be our conversation. I argue that we need it instead of positive biopolitics based on a new rationality of inclusion and care and transformation and prevention. And we need a philosophy of humanities that can help actually be up to the task of articulating it. At stake then is not some obscure academic quarrel, um, but rather our ability to articulate what it means to be human, not only as individuals, but as homo sapiens collectively. Uh, in connection and in connection with all the histories, dark and light of that question itself. And so there are many other ways in which the question of the biopolitical is being asked in, 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 that are deeply productive and interesting and, 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 and inspirational and uh, unwieldy uh, and strange uh, and disheartening. Um, a, a short and super incomplete hi in history of this may include the, the work of Jamaican born philosopher Sylvia Winter's interrogation of who counts as a human in colonial modernity in ways that reopen the category itself to reclamation. We, the humans, have been defined by exclusion. It includes those studying the microbiome including the role that microbial life in general inside of human bodies will to keep us alive. Most of the DNA inside you is non-human. The human is already inclusive of the non-human. It includes those studying anthropogeny, human origins, and the collective evolutionary origins of the human species itself in relationship to its planetary future. The human is continuous, it is migratory, it is changing. It includes those studying exper experimental astronautics and the limits conditions of survival in a fragile artificial environment. The human here is like a fish discovering water. It includes those studying CRISPR and other reweaving technologies for genetic therapies. The human can recompose itself at the deepest levels. The affirmation or negation of what, what the human is, quote unquote, also plays out through what humans can be. And this animates the political and philosophical controversies over, for example, gender reassignment therapies and techniques. The human is a contingent, complex, and pluralistic assemblage, available always to self-fashioning, self-recomposition, -re so that, for example, one may finally feel at home in their own skin. Though, quite clearly, the general availability of synthetic androgens and estrogens and progesterone draws on modern laboratory biotechnologies that Agamben's biopolitics defines as invasive, oppressive, and unnatural. So the positive biopolitics then is inclusive, materialist, restorative, rationalist, based on a demystified image of the human species, anticipating a future different from the one prescribed by many cultural traditions. It accepts the evolutionary entanglement of mammals and viruses. It accepts death as part of life, therefore accepts the responsibilities of medical knowledge to prevent and mitigate against unjust deaths and misery as something quite different from the nativist immunization of one population from another. This includes not just rights to individual privacy, self-privatization, but also social obligations to participate in an active biological commons. It is adamantly a biopolitics in a positive and projective sense. The assignment for philosophy and humanities then is to reconceive what it means to be human as always, but through a technologically sophisticated, comprehensively available and structurally diverse and thus order giving planetary biopolitics drawn in the image of life itself. It is literally a matter of life and death. Lastly, 
on what we might mean by the terms that name this name the conference of a new world order to the question of governance and planetarity itself. If the pandemic is a wake up call that the international anarchy of in which we are situated cannot hold, then the question is what forms may fill this void? Which way to guarantee preservation, to equitably distribute the populations of people on the surfaces? Do we have to congregate ourselves? The only way to filter ourselves is back into countries of past work. Why? How to employ planetary scale computation for what is most important? Not how do we, here's a problem to how can we apply planetary scale computation to it, but what is planetary scale computation for? How may these and other propositions be seen not only in historical terms, but even astronomical terms as well, that is as modes of planetary. These, I think, are the fundamental questions that should define what we mean by new, what we mean by world, and maybe what we mean by order. And there is clearly no time to waste. The pandemic and the crises of governance it laid bare were a sign of things to come. The international system could not respond to the planetary crisis because it was not built to do so. It's an architecture of another era. And for that same reason, it will fail to properly address climate change, the political economy of automation, the human right to spatial access, and so many other defining questions of our shared future. These are slow wave conditions that cannot solve themselves through spontaneity. They must be met with new modes of planning, mobilization, and structures. But very likely not in forms recognizable to the international system as it exists. For that, we will need to conceive and construct a different culture of governance. Societies must have the ability not simply to produce and consume mindlessly, but to deliberately compose themselves. Planless emergence may be the background force of evolution, but deliberation and deliberateness have themselves emerged through that evolution and must be re-embraced as the basis of collective agency. This is, I think, a matter of scale as well as leverage. If societies are able to sense themselves, make sense of themselves, model themselves, simulate themselves, act back upon themselves, then this also means recognizing that society is, always was, planetary and has been so long before modernity. Planetarity is not new, planetarity is newly revealed. We're going to construct the basis of a 22nd century worth living through. Our capacity for self-composition must be subject to our most intense imagination and reason. And I think this shift has everything to do with the end of the post-Cold post, the end of the post-Cold War era and its characteristic ideologies and commitments. In the West, the elevation of the political. Uh, during this era uh, came uh, as an ideal, came with a corresponding denigration of governance. Hooray for the political boo for governance. Whereas in Asia, the inverse was possibly true. Go the governance ascended at the expense of the political. So many books got it so wrong. On the right, free market libertarians became convinced that bottom-up emergence was all that was needed. But in fact, this gave way to huge platforms, corporations, technocracies that are based on deliberate top-down structure, long-term planning, and are indeed successful for it. On the left, the deconstruction of governmentality was honed into increasingly fine filters. And for many, uh, the valorization of sovereign individuals or vitalist life that must never be captured by governing apparatuses became an article of faith. But if power is nowhere and everywhere, then where does governance reside? If it is disqualified, is it disqualified? And if so, is it any wonder the societal self-composition is now so difficult? Perhaps instead, this is where infrastructure and governance converge by provision and mobilization. The challenges of planetarity then shift the project of governance itself at its core. Instead of the mediation of popular voice, 
it rotates toward the administration and allocation of viable ecosystems, inclusive there of human societies, not, not separate from them, and all of their myriad entanglements and semiotics. The luminary humanists of the last century, however, see this taking shape somewhere over there in the haze, can't quite make out what to do. Desperate languages persist. Just when coordinated human rationality and solidarity are most needed, Bruno Latour, for example, asks us to rescind the hubris of the moderns, but always a vague abstraction that at best that gets perhaps more suspicious with each new book, and to recognize instead a parliament of always local non-human actors. Even worse, Isabel Stengers recommends the embrace of a neo-vitalism an animism for a what she calls a compositionism so passive that it barely registers as action at all. These and other kinds of kitsch posthumanism are bound by their arc Europeanist moral renunciations of technical reason, other than other than as a, as a presently unattainable ideal, and an indeterminate embrace of the space of difference that they can imagine embodied primarily by the continents, others who are, in truth, not waiting around for permission to organize with all due instrumental rationality. For planetary governance, so many of the of giant blind spots must be filled in, especially the inability to conceive of anything not on the menu of the narcissistic liberalism, reductive economism, cartoonish totalitarianism, or sleepy slouch into post-secular comforts. Fortunately, other paths are open to us. But thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you very much. Um, we have now about 20 minutes for our discussion and also your questions. And because someone flagged it in the chat, so someone said that it's very difficult to actually see the chat. So just um, yeah, to give, you, to give you an idea where you find it. So when you are on the festival side and then on the live stream side, actually, then you find in the right corner next to the live stream, like a tiny button that you have to uh, press and then the chat will actually open and you can ask your question. So I will kick it off and I have three questions I would like to start with. One referring to your particular approach, Benjamin, and then I have two on the relation between technological rationalism and the possibility for political action. Okay, so to begin with, when listening to your argument for a planetary governance and also a positive biopolitics, for me, the influences of social science and philosophy are quite clear. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you can share with us a bit more like about how art and design have been relevant actually for your question of a positive biopolitics or how to envision like a better world and make to, and try to make sense of us, what's actually happening right now. Sure. So to... That's the first okay. one. So I can continue or we, we can, whatever you prefer. Maybe I go one at a time so I can keep them in mind, but I'll try to go fast. Okay. So I continue. Okay. Cool. So my second question then is on the notion of technological rationalism. So here I wanted to give you the chance to perhaps clarify the relation between um, technological rationalism and political action. So I imagine that um, many people listening to your argument or also picking up a book called The Revenge of the Real, Politics for a Post-Pandemic World, they might expect actually reading about what has to be done politically. Yeah, And then in fact, you say that, um, and then actually you propose a model of uh, planetary governments, which might seem for many to be primarily based on a planetary scale technological rationalism. And in fact, you say in your preface that this reading is not wrong, but that there is more than this. So I wonder if you can say a bit more about, for example, the importance of political decision-making in your, like for your argument, 
And I'm asking this question because some people might respond to your argument by saying that better sensing models require social conflicts over what is to be sensed yeah. and to what ends, yeah. and in other words, require politics. So yeah. what would you respond to these people? And how can we understand this relationship between technological uh, rationalism and politics and particularly decision making? Because you, are also mention, you also mentioned in your talk that the society is... Uh, It has a capacity to set to like to compose itself deliberately so i wonder how how you use this notion of deliberation and maybe yeah. just a quick like a short one my 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 third question which is very short and related okay, and i may i may have to ask you to repeat some of them so i can remember all of them but that's sure. okay. so you mentioned the human right to spatial access and you argue for this um new rationality of inclusion so I would like to ask you what actually happens to borders, like in the context of the planetary governments you propose. Okay, so let me go. The first one was about um, art and design and versus images. Okay, so yeah, so like, you know, my PhD was in sociology, but I teach in the arts department, but I've also taught at architecture school. And so I've sort of been quite, quite, quite a lot around this as well. Um, I think for design, the question of, I think the role of the speculative uh, has been more generally has been an important part of this. It's sort of thinking through problems in terms of, less in terms of trying to, there's a certain point by which critique uh, exhausts itself uh, and needs to rotate into a propositional or projective or speculative or, hypoth or, or, or hypothetical uh, uh, kind, kind of conversation. That's not necessarily about you know, always strictly prototyping a solution, mm -hmm. but rather about uh, about modeling modeling the space of of modeling the space of possibility, modeling the space of conflict, modeling the space of contradictions, in ways that are um, more more propositional. I, I think for my work, to a certain extent, the work we do at Strelka and in other places as well, it's 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 not so much. And maybe where there's just a little bit of difference here is it's it's not based on we're going to provide here here's a proposition that we think is 100 good or here's a proposition and, and therefore hooray solution or here's a proposition that we think is is bad and here's our critical warning to the world um it's actually like we're interested in speculation that are that we ourselves are kind of ambi ambivalent deeply ambivalent about and like the more that we investigate this speculation the more cle less clear we are about its about its qualities um that suggests a way in which we may have discovered something that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have we wouldn't have didn't already know uh in, in a way uh art i'm less less uh, art has probably been less uh less influential to a certain kind of extent i, I think one of the things and this may lead into the next question but i i think the way in which um uh, art has transformed uh, you know the way in which art discourse more generally And the ways in which it tries to engage with some of these topics, I think, is um, is institutionally deeply super, totally superficial. Uh, it is it is based on a kind of adamant cultural and aesthetic determinism that is intellectually indefensible. Uh, it is predicated on a kind of deeply unnecessary and historically ignorant dichotomization of culture and technology, for example, um, a valorization of the ineffable and the irrational as and the mythic as somehow a pathway towards liberation. Uh, and I think none of this, none of this is borne out by the human, the history of, of human, human experience. Um, to your question of, uh, around the politics and technology, I think the first Maybe it's sort of the first point, uh, and I, your person said, like, shouldn't the question of what gets modeled and how are we modeling this and what do we count and and are the, the conditions of, of contestation and power interest and all the rest of this need to animate this question of the model? Absolutely, a hundred, without a doubt. Um, this is, but this, what, what the implication of this to me is that this kind of dichotomization of technology versus politics doesn't hold uh it's it's kind of our version of the nature culture divide in in, in, in a way it's it's it never worked not only are there ways in which technology is in a way always political there are ways in which the politics is always uh, is, is only possible within the context of a particular technological milieu uh 
And there are, for, for example, there are ways in which what we might identify as power becomes constituted in technical systems, in media systems, in discursive systems, like the whole lessons of Foucault's archaeology, in such a way that to reduce power to the contestation of symbols, to reduce, sorry, to reduce politics to the contestation of symbols, to the contestation of a kind of legalistic, uh, a, a kind of legalistic contestation of, over, over symbols and uh, symbols and meaning and so forth and so on, is actually to evacuate the political of politics. Um, and so the, the, what I'm interested, there's what, to, to move forward in this in any kind of way whatsoever, that all of the difficult questions about how it is that uh, societies may wish to compose themselves is to not only to see technology as a kind of instrumental tool that might be used for a particular purpose, but to understand technology as a precondition by which that question can be asked in the first place, that the political is always preconditioned upon a kind of techno, a kind of a, a range of technological possibilities. That the condition of even, it's not just that there is a politics and now there is planetary scale computation and now we need to have a politics about planetary scale computation. Planetary scale computation has transformed fundamentally what the geopolitical is, what the political is, where power resides, what the leverage points of composition are in the first place. And so in that sense, uh, uh, this needs to be this kind of this kind of cycle. But it's to be clear, the conclusion to be drawn from that is not an evacuation of technology, not an evacuation of technology, a depoliticization of technology. What I'm arguing against is the de is, is a kind of detechnologization of the political, which I think is a fantasy. Um, what was the third one again? Um, the third one was about borders. So oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So look, it's um, I'm not. I I I I I am generally I'm, I'm broadly sympathetic to the goals of the open border movement. I I, I find that the the vestigial legacy of colonial and post-colonial states as ways of organizing societies are very close to not being worth it at all anymore uh, in terms of what they're able to provide. I think that the technologies of citizenship as a condition of access to infrastructure um, is one that is becoming increasingly fraught. And, and also for the ways in which that, I think that has implications to some extent, the ways in which uh, infrastructural politics is talked about on the left. Like, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who have good ideas about the ways in which, um, you know, different kinds of politics of data, but continue to argue about the power of citizens to take back the data. And it's like, I keep asking them, why citizen? No, honestly, like, why, why is this the fundamental technology? Why, are, why is the baseline concept that the Barcelonians live in Barcelona and the Parisians live in Paris and the Moscovites live in Moscow? That somehow that there's that this kind of fabricated indigeneity is 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 is, is not is irrelevant in many cases to the kinds the, the the basis of the real kinds of uh, of conditions that we may want to sort of to have. So, on the one hand, so here's what I say. It's like on the one hand, you can sort of think of it in three ways. Like my primary concern is how it is that we can you know if we think of it in terms of a provision of a universal basic services to people. You can move people to the services, which is what migration has been in place, people coming from North Africa to Europe, so they have access to the services. You can move the services to the people with a kind of, I don't know, planetary Green New Deal, where you're actually sort of like shifting capital and resources from the global north, to the global south to, to build up a viable social infrastructure in such a way that, that this kind of, that this, this de migration and desperation is not necessary. Or I don't know. People, you know, can log on, log online to many kinds of things. There's no ways in which states can evolve into political platforms more generally. Here's the thing: the issue has to do with how do you provide the services to people in such a way as that constitutes a kind of, you know, that there is a kind of equitable inclusiveness and, 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 and rationality and viability vi viability to this. Simply opening a border and making it so someone can come from here to there doesn't it does not in and of itself solve the question of what is providing these services? If it's not the state, what is it? Is, is it a corporation? Is it, it, what is the institutional mechanism that would be providing these services if, 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 if not the, 
it could be a fundamentally redefined understanding of what the state is and what its territoriality is. It's not defined by borders. It could be a, some something that might be private to some extent that that it, it, in whatever sort of regard, I, I don't know. But I, I think what it can't be, what seems to me just logically it can't be, is an idea that we will dismantle the infrastructure, the current infrastructures of the state and just presume that some kind of, you know, spontaneous local order will come into place and that all of this, all of the responsibility for, for care will be pushed to the edges of this of, of this network. I, I don't think that this kind of um, that, 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 that this kind of aesthetic version of anarchism can 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 work can work in work in this work in this regard. So um, I, I'm all for the question of sort of rethinking, perforating, redrawing borders. But the fundamental question that has to be drawn by this is what then is the in, is the infrastructural framework by which capital and resources can be mobilized so that those services are generally proper, properly provided. Yeah. Thank you for that. So just a short one on this again, like, do you think there will be more borders actually than fewer, like in this kind of context of the planetary government? This is a, this is oh, one. And oh yeah, let, let me, let me make one point because I want to make sure yeah. that when people are watching this, they're not clear. My argument is about planetary governance, not planetary governments. Mm -hmm. Governance. Right? So, it, so, so it's governance. It's like a way in which an always already planetary society may be able to compose itself it, it, at the scale of the phenomenon that it needs to compose. That does not necessarily imply a planetary government mm -hmm. in, a, in a in a kind of, you know, new world order sort of sense. That's that's not just to be clear to sort of hold it up in the past. But your point is your point is well taken at a certain point where if you remove national borders, that doesn't necessarily that, that that doesn't mean you're going to remove the processes of inclusion and exclusion exactly. of the processes of interiorization and exteriorization Th those happen at lots of different ways that are not national not even official in ways or another and it may be as you say that if somehow magically national borders were to disappear overnight um that what you would see quite quickly is a refortification of different kinds of of boundaries of inclusion and exclusion internal to those to the uh, to those countries themselves and so you know m what i'm arguing here is basically i'm trying to provide you know as a theorist a philosopher something that might what might constitute um an anti you know a positive model that is trying to take the critical mode and rotate it into something that's more projective something that is more speculative it's not a prediction I'm not predicting a positive biopolitics. I'm probably more pessimistic than, than many of people on the call in terms of what's likely to happen. Um, but is it likely that we're going to see a multiplication of borders? I, I think I, I think in many respects, yes. Uh, at least if we talk about these not as sort of as as um, uh, de facto borders rather than rather than official borders in one way or another. And most of these will be based not upon the borders of states, but on um, on privatization of territory yeah. uh, and the inclusion and exclusion from private privatizations of territory. I, I assume to many extent my son may have to purchase admission to the city that he ends up living in uh, in, in the future. Uh, and that may be the bigger problem. So I, I just noticed we really approaching the end, but I I really want to ask you uh, one final question because- I, you I mentioned... don't have a hard stop, so I can, whatever we want to do is fine. Okay, cool, great. Uh, so you mentioned the um, you mentioned the planetary green New Deal, right? And also in your book, you you actually write a lot about like new green, like or, like a post pandemic Earth and how um, yeah how climate change and how how to tackle climate change basically and how planetary governments can be kind of also provide uh, some some solutions for this. So I just want to give you the the chance to maybe say a bit more about this and i have maybe two sure. questions you want to you want to address also because while reading the book i what what really stuck with me was that you said that today government or like today for govern for governance the function is not only to give voice to the people right and this was quite interesting for me as a political theorist so it's not just about giving voice uh giving uh, well, reflecting the popular voice actually but it's also now about the direct management of the ecosystem so i wanted to ask you and this question is 
related to the second one I asked you about this um, technological rationality. So how do we, how would these planetary governments, for example, prevent something like colonial technocrats or the commodification of biological commons? Because you're also talking in the book, and I think, yeah, also in the talk, you mentioned the biological commons. So I would like to understand a bit this relation between uh, governments as um, like have this function of direct management of ecosystem, but at the same time also the danger of then we will see colonial technocrats or we see this kind of um, yeah increase of commodification of biological commons. And just briefly, because um, the G7 actually, so, so one one conclusion of the G7 was to say, okay, now to tackle all these problems, what we need is more partnerships. So we need more partnerships between governments and businesses, right? But here also, again, the question is, okay, then does this mean we see a commodification of biological commons? And uh, yeah, I would like to hear your view on this. Sure. So let me just, just for the, the listeners, kind of uh, repeat the point that you sort of made, which was the main around this, this discussion of the Green New Deal within, within the context of the book. And what I was simply was observing um, with this uh, was that there's something quite interesting and maybe more fundamental about what the Green New Deal, particularly since there were so many of them, and mm. they constitute in a certain extent a kind of a, a certain rotation towards a kind of um, you know, planetary coalition of some of, of some sorts. There's something fundamentally different about the logic of what a state is for and what a governance is for that is implied rather explicitly in the Green New Deal. That is, the purpose of this is, I mean, they are works programs, they are infrastructure programs and, 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 and the rest of this as well. But the key idea is that we have a relatively, we have a really short window to mobilize our resources, mobilize our capital, mobilize our labor, mobilize our, our planning capacity towards the construction and composition of a, of a social, technical, and economic infrastructure that will provide for the continuance of, 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 of complex human societies long into the future. That the carbon-based, that the intensive carbon-based systems that we have now uh, will, will, will soon go off the tracks. And so we are in this process of kind of having to remake the jet airplane while we're flying it. Uh, and that for this to have any chance of success for and, and to prevent truly catastrophic immiseration, not so much in the wealthy global north, but in really in less sense in the, in, in the global south, that there needs to be a, a really a fundamental shift in, in the politics of infrastructure in this kind of regard. But to your point, there also the idea of the Green New Deal is it has to do with like the function of the state is this kind of um, administration of ecosystems, which would include you know, carbon subtraction, decarbonization, materials replacement, um, you know, the development of, of, more, uh, of more viable and inclusive healthcare systems, all kinds of things that we don't necessarily think of as infrastructure, but are, as part of society. But that these, that this, this management of ecosystems, let's say, is now what states are for. This would, is not something that Rousseau or Locke or Kant, for that matter, would have recognized as a logical function of states, right? This is not something that directly come, that is, that, that is part of the, the French or American enlightenment tradition, for example, of what comes to the basis of, of, of democracy which is, as you say, more, more attuned to the question of how can we calibrate the state to be a proper medium of representation of vox populi or the will of, of, the, will of, of the will of the people. I think the fact that one of the aspects of this I think is quite interesting and positive is, is in a way this kind of de-anthropomorphization of the logic of governance. There's a kind of Copernican turn at work here that the question of how it is that complex societies will organize themselves cannot entirely be predicated on the mirroring of, 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 of subjective sense of, of local representation, but rather the, the long-term composition of the long-term conditions by which those, those societies are possible as physical, material, ecological phenomena in the world. And that's, I think there's a lot to this, to be, if 
turn all molecules into capital uh, and assume the market's going to fix it. Uh, that the somehow that the rationality of the market is 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 capable of solving any of these is capable of solving any of these kinds of things. What you're what doing it is in a way in which you have a combination of of, of large scale re, large scale resource allocation and planning and administration and local capacity to actually that to actually to actually make make good on this make, make good on this as well. I, I should say that to a certain extent, like I, I'm, I'm very much a pragmatist on, on this. Like I, I, I take quite seriously the existential threat that climate change represents. I, I think that, and there's kind of maybe two approaches to this that we need to keep in mind at the same time. If you start with the presumption that here we are right now in 2021, and we want to sort of move towards the direction of a more viable, you know, a more viable kind of society, what are the means that we would we think are going to be most that are most uh, that seem to be you know that, that, we, that we prefer in this kind in this kind of regard that might have to do and then there's other ways in which you might think of this more like what is the what are we solving for what do we need to get through and like we like whatever what by any means necessary we need to prevent this outcome that the existential risk that we're looking at is so great. That we need to we need we need to solve it and we need we need to solve it by 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 any means necessary. I'm probably closer to the second camp. Um, I would say probably those within the you know there are, there are others who who spend more time thinking about the 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 aesthetic qualities of particular means, talking about the kind of the, the kind of local micro political dynamics mm -hmm. of particular means. Um, who have never heard of direct air carbon capture, and have no, and have really have nothing to say whatsoever about why it is that the subtraction of gigaton of, of gigatons and gigatons of carbon will be will be will be necessary in order to stave off the worst kind of worst kinds of uh, responses to this. Um, I would here's another sort of point is I, I would and this just to also maybe even be more contrarian I suppose. I would want to differentiate what you said, colonial technocracy. I really would like to, for us to separate these terms uh, in what way or another. Like I, I, I happen to think, you know, I think we're that the legacy of colonialism, the present, this present sort of structure of colonialism are not just the, are not just the legacy of science and technology and engineering and reason and rationality. They are the legacy of myth and meaningfulness and symbolism and nationalism and humanism. Art has as much to answer for as a human project in the legacy of colonial violence as science and engineering and, 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 and technology does. I refuse to believe that the racist and the racist violence built into colonialism was rational. It was irrational at its core. It is an irrational, unreasonable impulse to organize and to imagine the construction of the human society according to these kinds of mythical hierarchies, these kinds of mythical hierarchies. Technocracy to me can mean a lot of different kinds of things. And honestly, like, I, I think it's a word that gets a little bit of a bad rap. Um, I, I, I think, and here's why, like, there's two connotations of this. One is, the kind of like, oh, the technocrats are back in power in Italy. What does that mean? Well, you've got the lawyers, you've got the bureaucrats, you've got the people who have no particular actual expertise for real on any of the real mechanisms of society. What they have is a kind of monopoly on, bureau on bureaucracy. This to me is actually the opposite of technocracy in some respects. Like the version of technocracy that I am more amenable to is the one proposed by Kim Stanley Robinson um, this American science fiction writer who basically says, like, who argues, like, why are the lawyers in charge of what the scientists are doing? Why, why does, you know, his wife is a forestry management person. Like, why does the person in charge of the forest, of managing the forest, have to go to the lawyers and the bureaucrats to decide, to convince them to decide what should be done with this natural resource? We would never do that with a doctor or a surgeon or something like this as well, but we do this with these large infrastructural systems. A tech, in this regard, a techno, technocracy would apply in a certain sort of sense, you know, the ways in which collective public reason becomes specialized into certain kinds of 
you know, informed expertise, which has everything to do with abstract knowledge and tactile heuristic knowledge in a way in which that knowledge can directly ha have a capacity for direct management on that, uh, direct management on that in ways that are not mediated through some kind of legalistic bureaucracy. And uh, to me, this goes exactly back to the question you asked before about the distinction between the political and the technical, right? I'm arguing against the idea that in a certain sense that, that the political and the technical are separate, that, that a de-technologized political is actually is real, and that all forms of this kind of uh, the, the kind of expression of reason and empathy need to be run through this the, through this kind of just discursive determinism. Mm -hmm. Since I was told that there's no event coming after us, so I can maybe I just ask another okay, question. No, I'm very I love I really prefer to like let's 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 talk it through. Great. So um, because you mentioned um, micropolitics uh, already, and tomorrow we have a talk with Katrin Pasik, and she will talk oh. about uh, micropolitics in online communities. So. Oh. When I listened to your argument, I had the idea that um, a planetary governance is is very much about macro politics, actually. And so I wanted to ask you, like, how would you see this relation between macro politics and micro politics? And here also, what role does collective organizing, for example, play uh, for your sure. argument? It is all about collective organizing. It's just collective organizing at different at different scales, um, and mm -hmm. collective organizing across locations. Like I, I think that the, consumpt, the the notion that collective organizing and and some sort of bounded physical localism are course are like necessarily correspondent is 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 is, uh, is anachronistic. Um, so let me let me make it let me make a, a point of distinction that, that may clear some things up. Like the way I think of it, planetary governance not governments, but governance is quite different than global governance. Like the global represents to me a, a kind of static macrological, um, predominantly kind of Eurocentric view of a, of a Westphalian subdivi subdivided, you know, sub subdivided world um, in this kind of thing. And it's about the kind of staticness of it. The planetary, and, you know, I'm certainly not the only person who has been writing about this, everyone from, you know, from, from, you know, from a whole range of different kinds of positions have been, you know, rethinking through this term. There's a piece I just published in Noema magazine um, yesterday that sort of deals with this term in another kind of way. But the planetary is, by definition, multi-scalar. It has to do everything from not just human scale, but subhuman scale. It's about molecular, the molecular and the micro and, and molecular and microbial life all the way up to the scale of an atmosphere and an hemisphere and an ecosystem. And it's one in which that the correspondence between the very, very small and the very, very large at a physical level is taken for granted, is presumed uh, that those kinds of things. So we, you know, an a carbon dioxide molecule and the accumulation of these molecules will have effects on, on human food supply, that, that the relationship to small and large is greater. But also that there's also a kind of, a, a, I think just as the small and the large are seen to be interrelated, uh, the local, uh, the, you know, the, the micrological and macrological of the human social are also seem to be interrelated. Like instead of like, if the global vision would have us to where once again we are sort of primarily encapsulated in particular cities and would act in a sort of way, I think the planetary presumes presumes the mobility of our species. It presumes that we are a migratory species, and that and that the capacities for collective action can operate at lots of different scales. Um, so. If the opposite of collective action is individual action, quite clearly I am arguing for the necessity of, 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 of collective action. If, if, the, if the opposite of collective action is something that is, is something that constitutes the, a, a, a use of technological abstraction and mediation, then I would say that, these, that this dichotomy is wrong. The dichotomy is wrong. Collective action is always technologically constructed and technologically mediated. That, Everything that we have ever really learned that's really significant about how the world works, we've learned through some, tech, some, some moments of technological alienation with telescopes or microscopes or, or you know, or genes or, 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 or what have you. But so maybe, uh, maybe I'll allow you then to sort of specify your question a bit more because I, th I think maybe I can give a more specific uh, reply um, mm -hmm. if, if, if that's the case. I think you pretty much answered my question. So maybe you can just give an example for like 
micro politics. So how would it, how would collective organizing look like um, on on a local level, for example? I know you write a lot about urbanism, well, so maybe this I, could be one of the Why would you assume that collective action and micro politics would be correspondent, as opposed to collective action and macro politics? Mm -hmm. Probably because I'm moderating tomorrow's talk and I'm kind of the way how the, the speaker tomorrow talks about micropolitics is very much about like small scale, like politics on a kind of really um, sm small scale in the sense of like um, online communities. This is why I have this. So, so, so let me, let me check. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not arguing that those kinds of, that those kinds of things are important or effective that, 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 you know, when you're able to kind of, push the decision-making capacity just to the point within the system where real-time decisions based on local, based on very kind of contextual knowledges can have, can be able to decide things. I'm not arguing. Yeah, picture and 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 giving this macro perspective on on these um, constellations and and um, 
how things are connected and um yeah i'm a bit uh speechless <laughs> also like out of words after a long day mm -hmm. and i don't I find mean, I, the I, I, right I, I, formulations I, I, yeah. anymore but um again a warm thank you to you for your fantastic talk um also to you rahel for the great uh, input and conversation and um and your work on this too and um Yeah, I can only say um, we come back tomorrow then. So this was the last session for today. We come back tomorrow at 11.30. Uh, with a, uh, the first session will be on digital capitalism with Timo Daum and Robert Feustel. And um, I'm looking forward already. And um, we will have a glass of wine here. Unfortunately, we cannot have it together with you. And I hope there will be the possibility again yeah, when... Yeah borders open <laughs> or you know when we can travel again and um continue so like yeah i'd love to thank you so much for the invitation thanks for the for the excellent conversation with Rael. i really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this recent work with your with your audience and and look forward to um you know engaging with people further Hope to see you soon. thank you yes Thank you. Goodbye and have Thank a you. nice day and evening where Thank you are. Bye-bye. So Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.